tell the difference, but my dad never knows when his hockey socks stink. Hmm. It made me wonder the same thing as Mohammed. Do bigger noses smell more things? Well, Mohammed, I don't know if bigger noses are the better smellers. If they were, maybe we'd use elephants instead of dogs to track people by smell. So I don't have the answer yet but I'm sure I can find out if I get nosy and sniff around. <coughs> My dad's nose is bigger than mine, but he can't smell the stink. I'll get to the bottom of it by the end of the show. But first, Leah has a question that takes us back to the basics. How do we smell things? Well, Leah, we're going to have to go way up your nostrils to get the answer for that. All the way up our nostrils, there's an area at the top of the nose called the olfactory epithelium. It's just a fancy word for smelling machine. That smelling machine is jam-packed with millions of special receptors that pick up smells that travel through the air. The receptors send a message to our brain, and that's how we recognize the smell. Speaking of funky smells, here's a question from Soham. Why do feet get stinky? Yuck. Just so you know, Soham, my feet do not get stinky. At least, I don't think so. I checked, and it turns out there's bacteria living between our toes. But don't worry, they're not the dangerous kind. They like dark, warm, damp places like our feet and they munch on dead skin and sweat. It's the bacteria's farts that cause the stink. <laughs> Excuse me. Sometimes it smells like rotten eggs. <laughs> Nasty. And sometimes it smells like stinky cheese. P.U. How about making something that smells a lot better? <laughs> the experiment! Hi, Cecilia and Arvin. Hi. Hi. You are scratch and sniff experts, right? Show me your method. First, you take your four gelatin powders. Strawberry, blueberry, orange, and lime. You put the gelatin powder in your bowl. Then we put the water. One scoop of water? Yeah. And then you put the glue in. Mix it all together. You have to make sure that you have a little cup and you're gonna trace it with a white crayon. The wax of the crayon keeps the mix from spreading. You can wait for it to dry. It only takes a few hours. It's all dry. Mm. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. Now, here's a not-so-sweet smelling question from Maddie. How do you know if you have bad breath? around if your breath smells bad is kind of embarrassing. But Maddie, I have an answer for you. Uh-oh, do try this at home. Lick your wrist, then let it dry a bit. That'll tell you how the tip of your tongue smells. Hmm, not bad. Then try the back of your tongue with an upside down spoon, but rub it gently. If the gunk is dark and thick, it most likely means your breath smells bad. So far, so good. A P 
piece of floss to your back teeth is another good way to tell if your breath smells bad. <laughs> Still fine. Danielle has a question about eating and smelling. Does food taste the same if you can't smell it? Hey, I know someone who's an expert on the sense of smell. And guess what? She can't smell anything. Hey, Zoe. Hi, Rachel. Come on in. Thank you. So this is my son, Lyndon. Hi, Lyndon. <laughs> um, Rachel, mm -hmm. I think it's time for a diaper change. Oh, why, um, well, thank you so much for letting me know. <laughs> You're welcome. So, when did you realize you didn't have a sense of smell? Uh, actually around, maybe I was a little bit older than Lyndon is now. Um, I would often get way too close to my brother's diapers. <laughs> uh, I'd always ask my mom, is that chocolate in there? And, uh, I guess after that it was a good idea to keep me away from diapers. <laughs> So I have some veggies here for us. So you never smelt anything in your life? No, nope, not a single thing. Actually, uh, until I was around 10 or 12, I thought that everyone was playing a joke on me. And it wasn't until one of the boys in class told me, hey, you smell bad. Um, from then on, I realized that smell is a real thing and it can certainly impact the people around you. <laughs> Oh, you know what, I've been baking us some bread. I've always been told that fresh baked bread is one of the best smells. And um, even though I can't smell it, I still love to eat it. <laughs> it's pretty hot. <laughs> ah, fresh baked bread. It's my favorite smell. Oh, good. I asked some of my friends what their favorite smells are. Ask a friend. Pancakes. It's my mom's curry. Orange. Chocolate. Watermelon. <sighs> Caramel. Pizza. Flowers. Vanilla cake. Lavender. I love the smell of books. <laughs> and what's your least favorite smells? Cigarettes. Ugh. Some air fresheners don't smell fresh. Yuck. Skunk. Ugh. Cow poop. Oh, that's disgusting. If someone pukes, I probably will puke after. Rotten anything. My dog's number two. My father's gas. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Oh, wait, I have another question. Is it dangerous if you can't smell? For sure. Uh, I'm never gonna be able to smell if there's smoke or a fire nearby. I won't smell any gas leaks. And is there any advantages of not being able to smell? Uh, I actually think there are way more advantages than disadvantages. But you know what? I have a really good example. This is my husband's hockey gear. Why don't you get close and uh, take a whiff of it? <sighs> Just like my dad's stinky hockey socks. Doesn't affect me at all. This is definitely one of those advantages I was talking about. Here, Rachel. Try this. Thanks, Zoe. How does it taste? It just kind of tastes crunchy to me, to be honest. For me, taste is mostly textures and colors. Um, actually, have you ever been sick before with a really stuffy nose? Mm hmm And how does food taste to you when you're all sick? Well, when my nose is blocked, it doesn't really have a lot of flavor. Well, that's actually because about 75% of everything we taste is reliant on our sense of smell. Wow. If the smell of the food can't reach the receptors in our nose or they don't work right, our brain doesn't get signaled and everything we eat will taste nearly the same. So for me, it's kind of like I'm always sick with a stuffy nose. <laughs> it's like our nose and tongue work together to make them super tasty. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to test how food tastes when I'm smelling something different. Like, stinky cheese. <coughs> I asked my dad to prepare three little dishes of mystery food, and I'm going to eat it and guess what it is. The first one. Mm. Mm. Sweet potato? Aw, I was wrong. Mm. Pumpkin? Nah, I was wrong. It's turkey. Last one. Hmm. I'm going to guess maybe apple? One out of three, right? <laughs> well, I guess I answered Danielle's question. If you can't smell food or smell one thing while eating another thing, it just won't taste the same. Here's another nosy question from Marina. How do animals with no noses smell? No nose? No nose? No nose at all? Ow! But 
Seriously, super question. I found out that crabs have smell-sensitive hairs on their antennae between their eyes. Mmm, smells fishy. Check out how butterflies smell. They have six feet and they smell with them. Their antennae also pick up smells that lead them to flowers with nectar. When they land on the flower, their feet tell them if it's edible or poisonous. Mm -mm -mm. Edible! And all those suction cups on octopus arms, they use them for smelling too. And here's a question from Ryan about a twitching animal nose. Why do rabbits twitch their nose? She's a zoologist who knows animal noses. She brought a rabbit to my show to show his. Please welcome Jennifer Sear Devine. Hi, Jennifer. Oh, you brought me a rabbit. His name's Vegas. He's a two-year-old domesticated rabbit. Well, I bet I know what his favorite dance style is. Oh. Hip hop. Oh. <laughs> Very <laughs> cute. <laughs> Look at his nose twitch. <laughs> Why does he do that? Well, in short, it's actually to help them smell better. You see, the sense of smell for rabbits is incredibly important to their survival. Inside those nostrils, in the nasal cavity, you have about 100 million smell receptors that help capture the odor from the air. Is that more than we have? Way more than humans have. In fact, some scientists say it's up to 20 times more than what humans have. Wow, so when he twitches, more smell comes in? That's right. Every time the rabbit twitches its nose, more air is coming into the nasal cavities, and therefore the receptors at the back capture the odors off of that greater amount of air. So the rabbit is basically able to pick up smells that humans can't possibly pick up on. Hmm. So he probably smells at this carrot, even though I haven't put it in front of his face? Oh, absolutely. He smelled <laughs> that a long way off. <laughs> And what's really interesting is rabbits don't just use their sense of smell to find food. They also use it to know if there's a predator around or to know if there's danger, like a forest fire. What's well, really cute if you want to try it, twitch your nose at the rabbit, because every time you twitch your nose at the rabbit, it actually will twitch its nose right back at you. <laughs> well, thanks for helping me find stuff out. You don't happen to have an elephant by any chance, no? Nope, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm asking because of Nayla's question. Oh. Why do elephants have a long nose? I found out that elephants do have a great sense of smell. But the reason their noses are so big is because elephants are so big. Their gigantic legs and heads make it kind of hard for elephants to bend down for food on the ground or to reach food in trees. Their long nose lets them get at food a lot more easily. An elephant's nose can lift up to 350 kilograms. That's like lifting about eight toilets. Da -da. Or four kangaroos. Da -da -da. Pretty impressive. At the end of their nose, some elephants have parts that are kind of like fingers that they can use to grab small objects. And because their nose is long and flexible, it can sniff things out without the elephant even moving its head. Plus, they suck up water with their nose and squirt it into their mouths. And that gives me an idea for... My Great Challenge! Okay, for My Great Challenge, we have Leah, who's Elephant Stomper, and Max, who's Elephant Chomper. <laughs> you guys are gonna use your elephant noses to do elephant things. After that, you have to trumpet as fast as you can because the first elephant to trumpet wins. On your marks, get set, Go! First challengers have to pick up two bundles of branches. Next, 20 peanuts. By the way, real elephants aren't into peanuts. They're way too tiny to satisfy their huge appetites. Keep going! But picking up peanuts is a tricky challenge. <laughs> Stomper is in the lead with her peanuts. She's done, and now she has to pick five hanging bananas. Go, 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 pick! <laughs> Chopper only has a few peanuts left. <gasps> he got them! <laughs> Chopper's catching up. Stomper has all her bananas, and Chopper is still behind. Stomper is now at the drinking station. That's the last stop. Challengers have to suck up all the water in the bowl and squirt it out. Here comes Chomper. Can he catch up? 
Mumber, first one to jump it wins. <laughs> we have a winner. And now, here's a question from Aaron about an animal that smells underwater. How do sharks smell underwater? I found out that smell is so important to sharks that they're actually called swimming noses. A shark can smell one drop of blood in a million parts of water. That's like being able to smell a single teaspoon of juice in a swimming pool. What? You're gonna make my head explode! It seems unbelievable, but it's true. Sharks actually suck in water to take a sniff. The water touches a bunch of sensitive smell receptors inside the nostrils, and they send a message to the brain. Over half their brain is made up of smell detectors. I wouldn't want to have a nosebleed around the swimming nose. Hey, speaking of nosebleeds, how do you stop a nosebleed? <laughs> Ah, yes, the nosebleed. Here in ancient Rome, we have found the solution. Rub your limbs with sheep wool. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But if this doesn't help, you can stuff your nostrils with burnt up ashes from tadpoles. <coughs> That's pretty wild. Hundreds of years later, it was still kind of weird. A toad worn around your neck will stop the bleeding swiftly. What's that you say? You want a more modern way? No problem. Simply drop a key on a string down your back. Ah, oh, the marvels of modern medicine. <laughs> so weird. Today, we know you have to. Tilt your head down a bit so the blood won't go down your throat and then pinch just under the bony part for five minutes. If it just won't stop, get help. How could some people smell things better than others can? I checked, and it's mainly because of our genes. No, not the ones we wear. The genes in our bodies are the things that make us who we are, and every person has their own special combination of smelling genes. Some people can pick up certain smells that others can't. And some people have such good senses of smell that their job is to make perfume. Mm -hmm. Or smell bad odors to help companies make things like deodorant. In some Chinese medicine, they even use professional fart smellers to help detect sickness. Ooh, very healthy. I want to test my sense of smell. Jennifer agreed to a face-off to see whose nose is more sensitive. I think I'm ready. <laughs> We're using this cool little gadget called the Nasal Ranger. It's used to measure the smell from places like landfills and figure out if the stink is too strong. You can actually see here the filters that allow the air in and out. And this is a little dial that helps determine how much odor is actually coming in. So depending on that dial, it'll determine whether you have a better nose or whether I have a better nose. I'll start with the cow manure first. We all smell things differently because there are close to a million different combinations of smelling genes. Don't smell anything yet. Plus, smell is connected to our memories, emotions, and taste. Oh, I'm starting to smell it. Some people like certain smells that other people can't stand. Oh, I think I smell something. <laughs> this is gonna be gross. But am I picking up the smell of manure and rotten food faster than Jennifer? Oh! <coughs> we both agree they stink. Oof, it smells like under my kitchen sink. <laughs> yeah, yep. We're finishing our experiment with a sweet smell. Ooh. Oh, there we go. I got it. <laughs> I like that smell yeah. much better. <laughs> much better than those ones. <laughs> well, the results are in. I outsmelled you. Oh, that stinks. <laughs> and my nose is smaller than yours. You're right. I think I'm ready to answer the question that started off today's show. Do bigger noses smell more things? Well, Mohammed, the big answer is... Size doesn't matter. 
it mostly depends on how many smell receptors we and animals have and how our brain deals with the information it gets from our nose. A rabbit's nose is much smaller than a human nose, but it has millions more smell receptors and can smell more things. Dogs are also great smellers, which is why we use them to sniff out dangerous things. Some animals, like butterflies, don't even have a nose, but thanks to the smell receptors on their feet, they can tell if flowers are poisonous. Plus, we all have our own unique combination of genes that make up our smelling machine. My nose is smaller than Jennifer's and my dad's, but I proved it's more sensitive. Hi, welcome to Finding Stuff Out, the show where you send in your questions and I find out the answers. I hope I'm not scaring you right now. I'm doing this because of a question I got from Austin. Why do spiders have eight eyes? Yeah, why do they? I know spiders have eight legs, but eight eyes? That's crazy! Well, Austin, I don't know why spiders have eight eyes, but by the end of the show, I'll find out the answer because I'm focusing on one of our most important senses, sight. Now here's a question from Sophia. How do we see with our eyeballs? Well, Sophia, I made this music video to answer your question. Check it out. We see with them, light like comes through our pupil and the lens to the retina, where rods and cones send a signal to our brain, not our nose, but the image comes in, upside down, so our clever brain turns it around, then the down is up and the up is down, and it all makes sense again. Glad I don't have to wear a spider eyes every day. Anyway, here's a question from Serena. Why do cats' eyes glow in the dark? Well, Serena, I checked. And remember that retina I sang about? It's this layer at the back of the eyeball that senses light. Cats have an extra layer behind the retina. It captures more light. That's why cats can see well in the dark. That extra layer is like a mirror, so it reflects the light that comes into the cat's eyes and it's why their eyes seem to glow in the dark. Meow. But the cat's eyes aren't glowing. They're just reflecting the light back out again. Why can't we see infrared? Well, Anthony, I checked, and it's amazing, but we can't see some kinds of light. The sun makes light in what are called waves. Just like waves in water, they can be different distances apart. They call all these light waves a spectrum. Our eyes can only see the light waves in the middle of the spectrum. It's what we call visible light. But there are waves of light we can't see, like ultraviolet and infrared. But birds and insects can see ultraviolet, and some snakes can detect infrared. And lucky for them, they can sense not just the infrared light made by the sun, but also the infrared light animals give off. Mmm, tasty! The snakes don't see that light through their eyes. They have sensors lower down that detect the infrared of the animals they hunt. Now here's a question from Dante. How can hammerhead sharks see with eyes like that? Yeah, imagine if you had eyes way out on the side of your head like that. I can see you. And you too. It looks like a hammerhead shark's eyes point to the side but I found out that their eyes are tilted slightly forward so they can see depth just like we can. And with their eyes way out on the side like that, they can not only see out to the front and sides, they can see behind themselves too. I'm glad they can't walk on land. Humans have excellent vision, but we're not perfect. We can get tricked by something called an optical illusion, and that's today's... Uh-oh, do try this at home. She knows all about eyes. And I think we're in for a fun surprise. Please welcome Dr. Kathy Mullen. Hi, Harrison. I've got something really fun to show you. 
I'm being hypnotized. Stop it. <laughs> wow, it really looks like it's spinning, but it's just a normal piece of paper, right? Yeah, the image on the piece of paper isn't moving at all. But why does it look like it's moving then if it's actually not? Well, this pattern's forming an image on the back of your eye, rather like in a camera. And then as you move your eyes over the page, that image on the back of your eye is moving all around. And your brain is fooled into thinking that the pattern's moving. Cool. What's next? Now, which of these two lines do you think is the longest? The longer one. The longer one is the top one, I'm going to say. Well, I think most people would agree with you, but that's not actually correct. What about this one, then? What? No, that one isn't longer, either. In fact, both of these lines are exactly the same length. What? 37. And 37? Yeah, your eye isn't telling the truth. They're the same. They're the same length. But how? And what's happening here is that these two end pieces that are fanning out mm -hmm. like this, they're stretching the line and making your brain think it's longer than it is. But with this bottom line, the opposite is happening. The little pieces pointing inwards are fooling your brain into thinking it's shorter. That's crazy. But there's lots of other illusions like this one. Ah, so which of these three blocks do you think is the tallest? Uh, hmm. The tallest one is the one at the back. But actually, they're all exactly the same size. They're all exactly the same? They are. 13. 13? They're all 13 centimeters. Yep, this is an illusion of perspective. So it's rather like a tall building. We know when we look at a tall building that it's very, very big, but when we're a long way away from it, it might seem quite small. Let's check it out in the real world. So we have these three identical rectangular blocks here, and if we set them up, the one closest will look the biggest and the one furthest will look the smallest, right? Yeah, that's right. But in our illusion, our brain thinks that the block at the right is bigger than the others because the perspective lines trick us into believing that it's further away. But take away that perspective lines and the three blocks look the same size. It's only a drawing. It's not like in the real world. So I guess seeing isn't always believing. Well, not exactly. Thanks for being on my show. You're welcome. Dr. Mullen showed me some illusions, and I'm gonna test one out on some kids today with my assistant, Evan, here. To me, it looks like a number eight is doing circles. It looks like an endless tornado, and I feel like I'm gonna fall in it. It looks like a giant eye. It's really big, but scary. It just looks like the circles never stop, and they look like at the end, it changes colors. Some illusions involve not seeing things that actually are there, as I'm about to show you in... My Great Challenge! Today, my great challengers are Michael, yes. Nicholas, yes. and Alexia. Yeah. <laughs> so today, my great challenge is all about optical illusions, things that aren't always what they seem at a first glance. So today, I'm focusing on the illusion of camouflage. This moth is camouflaged. It blends in with its background, so it's hard to see, just like this scorpion fish. So here are the rules. There are 60 jelly beans hidden throughout the attic, and you'll have two minutes to try to find as many as possible. Sound good? Yeah. yeah. So we have Team Hawk, Team Lion, and Team Wolf. One of the jelly beans is right in front of them. OK, so you have two minutes starting now, go. Ow. <laughs> Hawk gets it. Wolf uses her predator eyes to spot her first jelly bean. And another quick one. Lion and Hawk go for the computer desk. I hid eight jelly beans there, including one in a candy jar. <laughs> that one will be hard to spot. How many can they find? One. And only two for Lion. Oh, Hawk finds the one in the candy jar. Lion makes a move for the experiment table. I've got 11 tricky ones hidden there. How many can he find? One. Two. Oh, he's walking away. Going toward the pink napkins. Misses it. 
He walks by the yellow one too. There's five jelly beans in the small area near the aquarium. Hawk finds one of them. I also match the colors of my jelly beans to the toys at the back of the attic. Miss the one on the gorilla. Hawk joins Wolf upstairs to see if she's missed any. Bingo! 30 seconds. They've been searching for a minute and a half, but there's still a lot of jelly beans left. Looks like Lion saw something. Or maybe not. My masterpiece, the granola special, still hasn't been found. But Wolf is getting dangerously close. Will she find it? No, it's just too good. <laughs> 10 seconds. Time for a last ditch effort. Okay, time's up. Let's see how you guys did. Seven, eight, nine jelly beans for Team Wolf. Let's see how Team Lion did. Three, four, five jelly beans. So Team Wolf is beating Team Lion right now. Aww. And let's see how Team Hawk did. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. It looks like Team Hawk's our winner. Yes. Awesome, congratulations. So you guys found about 30 jelly beans, which means there are still 30 more hiding in this attic. What? In order to fool the eye, all good camouflage relies on matches in color, texture, and even shape. That's the key to the survival of a lot of species in nature. The animals that want to eat them can't see them. Well, all of you guys get to keep the jelly beans that you found, but I wouldn't eat them because I painted some of them, and also Squeakers, my guinea pig, was running around here, so I don't know if the brown ones are actually jelly beans. Ew. Yeah. Well, thanks for playing my great challenge, guys. And why do people wear glasses? Maybe it's a fashion statement. Actually, it helps them refocus the light. It's pretty cool how it works. Check out this cartoon I made. If you have perfect vision, your eye looks like this. If you are nearsighted, this happens. Because of the way your eye is shaped, you can see things that are close to you just fine. But something that is far away gets focused here in front of the retina instead of on the retina. If you're farsighted, you can see things that are far away. But because of the way your eye is shaped, things that are close to you get focused behind the retina, so it looks fuzzy. Glasses refocus the light to be in the right place, not behind or in front of your retina. Why do people go blind? To find out, I came to Calgary to visit with Tate Hoyam. Hi, welcome to my show. Thanks for having me on your show. So, to answer Devin's question, what causes blindness? Well, it can be by an accident. You can be born with it, you can get a disease that causes it, or your eyes can just wear out over time. Tate is 12 and lost most of his vision to a disease when he was just a baby. But that doesn't stop him from doing a lot of cool things. Like playing this weird instrument called a hydrolophone. That's awesome. When someone's blind, do they see anything at all? It depends. Some people are completely blind and can't see anything at all. But some people can see shapes and shadows. Some people can see a bit. Anything. Tate asked me if I wanted to see what he sees. Can I show you some? Sure. OK. Tate, where are you? I'm here. Close your eyes. Close my eyes. Why? Because I'm going to put goggles on you. It makes it seem like you have less vision. Oh, OK. OK. And there. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Oh. It was weird with the goggles. I could still see a bit, but even walking around was difficult. I can teach you how to use a cane. Oh, OK. So the two things you need to remember is don't lift it up in the air and hit people. Right. Use the hand that you are most comfortable with, right. left or right. So my right hand. Mm -hmm. And then make sure your hand is in the middle, like near your stomach. Mm -hmm. And then when you're walking, you just have to go like that as you're walking. Just left and right? Yep. And you have to do it like opposite to what foot. So. Right, left, right, left, right, left, like that. Right. And then if you hit something, you would stop. OK. Tate can go anywhere he wants with his cane. Which, which way did you go? Tate? I'm not quite there yet. Tate? 
So how can blind people manage to do the same things that sighted people do? Well, even if you're completely blind, you can still read. It's called Braille. Why don't I show you some? Sure. How does Braille work? It's made up of dots, normally on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. But people can actually tell what it says by putting their fingers on it. How about I show you how to make the letter F? Sure. So if you put one there, one there, and one there, that's F. OK, yeah. You got then, it, yeah. And then you can feel the bumps. Yeah, and they're a little bit smaller on a piece of paper, but right. they're still there. Right. Mm -hmm. What does it say on this piece of paper? How about you find out? There's a kind of a cheating thing here. Okay. You can look at it. OK. <laughs> Let's see here. We got an F. I. What's this? <laughs> Oh, that's an N. <laughs> You're probably a lot faster than this, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Here, how about I try it? OK, yeah. And I'll, I'll read it with my fingers, too. OK, go for it. Uh, finding stuff out with Harrison and special guest Tate. Nice. Yeah. Why don't we go play some road hockey? Sure. Well, Harrison, since we can't see very well, a lot of times me and other people who are visually impaired like to use these, a ball or a puck with a bell or bells inside it. Right. OK. OK. Yeah! Where did it go? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> of course, it's not exactly a fair game. Yes! Kate is so used to not having sight oh. that he can sense where things are. Yeah! But I sure can. And again. And again. Ah! <laughs> yes! Ah, OK, before you get too far ahead of me in points, I want to thank you for being on my show. Thanks for having me. OK, so you've heard the expression, seeing is believing. But can hearing be seeing? Is it true some people see colors when they hear music? Seeing color is when you hear music. I think my parents see red when I play my drums too late at night. Just kidding. But I checked Erica, and it's actually true. There really are people who say that they see colors when they hear music. That made me think, if you take all the colors in the universe and multiply it by all the sounds in the universe, that could be like a bazillion combination. Guitar times yellow equals orange times cello. Head getting warm. If there's eight notes in an octave times a million colors, multiplied by a rim shot, flats and sharps and banjos and harps, brain sending signals at light speed. You're gonna make my head explode. People who can see color when they hear sounds have what's called synesthesia. Scientists still aren't sure why it happens but they think that for people who see color when they hear music, there might be some overlap in their brains and the parts that normally separate hearing from seeing. Now here's a question from Jessica. Why don't worms have eyes? She knows about bugs, the hows and whys, and the reason that worms don't have eyes. Please welcome Julie Hamill. Hey, Irison. I oh. have a surprise for you. Gee, for me? Ugh. What about these worms? How do they see if they don't have any eyes? Well, here you go. You can look at it. Well, actually, they have light-sensitive cells, which help them detect light. But there's no lights underground for them. <laughs> yeah, but when they're going out, it's big danger for them. Julie tells me that the light-detecting cells tell the earthworm when it's leaving the safe, dark underground for the dangerous light above-ground world. So are there any other animals that don't have eyes? Well, actually, there's cave fish, which live really, really deep underwater where it's all dark. So they don't need eyes. They have sensitive cells which detect pressure and also movement around them. And there's also bats. They have eyes, but they use echolocation. Right, echolocation. That helps them when it's pitch dark. Notice that echolocation has the word echo in it. Bats make really high-pitched sounds, but we can't hear them. Like all sounds, they travel through the air as waves. When the waves hit an object, they bounce off that object. A bat listens carefully to the echoes. That's echolocation. And I see you've brought some spiders with you, and those all have eight eyes, right? Not exactly. I have a couple species here. Would you like to see the tarantula? OK. 
Like most spiders, the tarantula has eight eyes. But others have six, four, and even two eyes. There are even spiders with no eyes at all. But at this moment, all I can think about are the eight eyes crawling on Julie's arms. So can it see me right now with all those eyes? Yeah, they can see quite a lot because of the eyes. They can see all around them, but he sees you as a shadow. Right, so they don't see color, it's all black and white? It's all black and white and it's all fuzzy. That's kind of weird then. They have all those eyes, but they can't see as well as us. No, but they can see more around. Right. If I do this, they'll see me. Weird. <laughs> Well, thanks for being on my show and for not putting the spider on me. Maybe next time we'll try and take it. We'll see. All this spidery talk brings me back to the question that started this web of exploration. Why do spiders have eight eyes? Well, Austin, the big answer is the better to see you with. If you had eight eyes and eight arms, imagine the wild drum solo you could play. Or maybe not. I found out from Julie that spiders don't actually see as well as we do, but having all those extra eyes lets them see in many different directions at once. It also lets them see the things they want to eat and avoid the things that want to eat them. That's my show for this week. Thanks for watching. me of a question I got from Mohammed. Why does my body make so much noises? <laughs> Pardon me, Mohammed. I'm not sure why my body burps. Or hiccups. Or sneezes. Or farts. Hmm. But I'll find out by the end of the show. I asked my friends what kind of weird noises their bodies make. Ask a friend. One time I coughed and sneezed at the same time and it kind of made a noise like <laughs> When I grind my teeth, um, it sounds like my guinea pigs when they do it. Crack of my fingers. My tummy makes a really weird sound, kind of like <laughs> When I'm um, nervous, like <laughs> I fart sound with my armpit. When I was a baby, I farted a lot and I burped it a lot. And now, still a lot, but a lot more. My sneeze is so loud that it scares people. Once in class, I farted so hard that I went up, and it was really loud. <laughs> I wonder why our bodies just can't keep <coughs> quiet. To find out, I call the <coughs> doctor. <coughs> doctor, doctor, my body won't pipe down. <coughs> Whatever it is, Dr. Robert, make it stop. Hi, Dr. Robert. Hi, Zoe. I heard that you had some questions, and I brought a friend, Uvula, to help us answer them. Don't you think she has jaw-dropping good looks? <laughs> Dr. Robert, I... <clears throat> I should probably let Logan ask a question before I start burping again. Why do people burp so much? <clears throat> oh, sorry. Well, normally we burp anywhere from six to 20 times a day. Okay, but what if you've burped that much in the last five minutes? Well, how much you burp depends a lot on your digestive system uh, and also how much air you swallow when you're eating and drinking. Hmm. So I think in your case, it's possible that you've been burping a lot because you've been drinking too much. Uh... No, no, no. <coughs> Water. Uh. <laughs> did you do that on command? Yes, I did it on command. <laughs> cool. Can you teach me how to do that? Well, as long as you promise not to do it in school. Yep. Okay. You have to take a big breath in like you're breathing, except while you're doing that, you have to swallow. So you go kind of like this. <clears throat> and then when you feel it inside you, you go. <clears throat> like that? Exactly. <laughs> Zoe, could you hold these raisins for me? Yeah. So if we look at uvula, you can see two holes leading down these tubes. So this tube in front is called the trachea, and it is for air. It's supposed to go through to your lungs to help you breathe mm -hmm. and to help you talk. 
And this tube back here is the esophagus, and that is meant for food and drink, not for air. But sometimes when we eat and drink, we also swallow some air, and air goes down the esophagus into the stomach. And then it has to come out. As a burp? Exactly. How about we take some raisins and we can give them to uvula and see how it works. Oh, I thought these were for me. Here. Sometimes if you eat foods such as like broccoli or bananas or raisins, you might be burping a little bit more. Better lay off the raisins. Well, here's a question I think you can help me answer. How long can a burp be? Well, I do know someone who used to be able to burp the whole supercalifragilistic expialidocious, but I don't really know how long a burp can be. Hmm, let me go check that out. All right, I'll be here if you need me. Wow, I can't believe this. You're gonna make my head explode. The longest burp ever recorded was 1 minute, 13 seconds, and 57 milliseconds by Michele Forgione in Italy. In 2009, Paul Hunt set the Guinness World Record for the loudest burp. At 109.9 decibels. Sorry. That's louder than a jackhammer at one meter away! Wow! But I guess it's better out than in, because if you need to burp and don't, it can go down your digestive system and cause gas from the other end. So if excess air and gases make us burp, does that mean there's nothing wrong with me? Well, in your case, probably not. It's probably just that you were drinking too much of the bubbly water. But sometimes if people are burping a lot, it could mean that they have something wrong with their health and need to see their doctor. Well, here's a question from Juliet. What is your stomach grumble? Here, Zoe, why don't you take a listen yourself? Sounds like I'm really sick. No, I don't think so. I think that's just the sound of a healthy digestive system. Oh, phew. These gurgles happen all day long. It's a sound of air bubbles moving through your digestive system. And when there's food in your stomach, sometimes these noises can be harder to hear. So when your tummy rumbles, it just means it's empty and it's time for you to fill it? It can mean that, but you can also hear grumbling in your digestive system when you have food in it and your body is digesting it. That reminds me. Here's another funny body sound question. Can everyone whistle? Uh oh, do try this at home. Yes, everyone can whistle. It's just a high pitched noise made by blowing air through a small hole. Step one is to pucker up, step two is to blow. My tongue needs to be in just the right position, or we get... That's more like it. If you're having trouble whistling by blowing air through your lips, try sucking instead. Hey, I wonder what other weird noises we can make with our mouths. Wow, that's beatboxing, and it's super cool. And I want to do it. So I met up with beatboxing champ Malcolm Humes and his friends Tanika and Olivier. That was the best. It's super easy. All you have to do is use your nose, mouth, and throat together as an instrument. Cool. I never thought of it that way. First, you start off with a B that sounds like The second sound is a T that sounds like And the last sound is a K that sounds like 
and then you say the sentence, boots and cats. See, you're already beatboxing. It's really simple because when you're doing boots and cats, you're already doing the boots and cats. So how is it we can make the same noise but sound so different? Well, it's because we all have different shaped mouths. So even if we do the same beat, it'll sound different. sound? Hmm, I think my favorite sound is <clears throat> pretty much how it works is I break it down in four sounds <clears throat> and mm, together really fast. It sounds like <clears throat> That's so cool. It's like you have another mouth in there. <laughs> want to hear how you beatbox. It's time for... My Great Challenge! These are my friends who like to box a beat. They practice day and night, but will they bring the heat to the fighting stuff out? Beatbox me. Okay guys, here are the rules. Each challenger has to impress us with their beatboxing skills. We'll be judging you on creativity, performance, and rhythm. Are you ready? Yeah! yeah. All right, Max, here you go. Awesome. All right, Tucker, your turn. We're gonna go to side. We'll be back. Who do you think is gonna win? You. Well, I think you're gonna win. Thank you, but I still think that you're gonna win. 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 You are Okay, guys, we've got the result. I personally think that Tucker did really good because it was super creative. I also think Max did a really good job because he had a good rhythm. And the winner is... Tucker, you won! Yeah. <laughs> Good job, Tucker. I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't me! See, I told you so. But this reminds me of another question I got. Why do people fart a lot? Did you know the average person farts up to 50 times a day? To help explain why, here's an experiment. <laughs> the experiment! Hi, Melissa and Harrison. Hi, Zoe. We're gonna be making farts in a cup. Ew. <laughs> farts in a cup? But how? We are gonna first add the glue and then... We're gonna add some food coloring. Harrison, why are you using green? Uh, because that is the fartiest color. <laughs> <laughs> we have mixed everything together and we're gonna add liquid starch. Oh. I put these in our cups.
<laughs> I'm blown away by your talent. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Bye, Zoe. Bye, Zoe. Noises like farts are made by air bubbles trapped in the goo, trying to escape. Just like in our bodies. Food is digested by bacteria that lives in our stomach and intestines. They break down food and make gas. That gas has to go somewhere, so... Oopsie. Farting happens for pretty much the same reason as burps. Gas buildup. Oops. Some foods are harder to break down and cause bacteria to make extra gas, like how beans make you fart. <laughs> Excuse me. Other causes are food intolerances or even where you are. On a plane, the pressure of being so high in the air pushes on the gas in your body, which means more farts. <laughs> Sounds like the reasons we fart are as unique as farts themselves. <laughs> Farts are as different as snowflakes. Some are silent as a mouse, some take down the house. Some toot, some tremble, some roar. From the tiniest squeak to the quack of a beak. A fart might stink, but it's never a bore. Oh, farts are as different as snowflakes. It depends on your bump if they explode like a gun. Or if they're silent but deadly. Some patooties just poof, while others raise the roof. Eat lots of beans and you'll make quite the medley. You. <laughs> Speaking of gas, I found out that the sound of cracking your knuckles is actually gas being released. Each finger joint is protected by a sack of liquid. When we crack our joints, we stretch the sack and gas is released, making a pop, crackle, and snap. A flat Earth corner! Uh-oh, help! In ancient Russia, we believe hiccups mean you're cursed with bad luck. Lucky, there's another old Russian superstition that says hiccups mean someone is thinking about you. <laughs> I wonder what's got me on their mind. <laughs> we now know none of these theories are true. <laughs> when our stomachs expand after eating too much, too fast, or drinking carbonated drinks, the stomach irritates the diaphragm, which makes it contract. But eating and drinking aren't the only way we get hiccups. Babies can get them after coughing or crying. Now here's a question from Megan. What's the longest someone's hiccuped? Well, Megan, I found out in 1922 Charles Osborne picked up a pig to weigh it when he started <laughs> hiccuping. And he kept hiccuping for the next 68 years. <gasps> what if I never stop? It says here that there's lots of things people do to get rid of hiccups, but there's no foolproof cure. <laughs> ah! oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Dr. Robert, you scared me. Did it work? <laughs> no. Hmm. We should probably try something different. <laughs> Gargle. <gasps> Hold your breath. <gasps> Drink upside down. <gasps> Hold your tongue. Lemon. <gasps> oh, what am I going to do? None of these home remedies worked. Hang on. <gasps> I'm not hiccuping. Wow. Well, there are a lot of home remedies out there and a lot of stuff you can find online. But really, nothing is proven to work. After some time, the hiccups will usually go away on their own. <laughs> cool. 
sorry. <laughs> that reminds me. How can some people have really loud sneezes and other people have really quiet sneezes? <laughs> well, Indira, the more air you take in and the bigger you are and the more forcefully it comes out, the louder the sneeze is. Some people can control their sneezes by stifling them. <laughs> What's the difference between sneezing and coughing? Well, when you sneeze, it's your body trying to keep your nasal passages clear and forcing things out with a gush of air. And when you cough, it's your body trying to keep things from going down into your lungs and keeping your airway clear. A cough really helps protect our lungs because if we have our friend uvula here from before and we see this pipe that is in front, that is the one that goes down to your lungs and we don't want anything getting in there. So if you have saliva dripping down, like when you laugh too hard <laughs> or stuff that's dripping down the back of your nose or something like food that's going where it's not supposed to go, well, your body coughs to protect your lungs and forces it out. Hmm. So I was just laughing too hard? Yeah, I think that probably was the case. Well, thanks, Dr. Robert. Thank you, Dr. Zoe. <laughs> Coughing, sneezing, burping, farting. Wow, our bodies really don't know when to shut up. Well, how do you do that? Dr. Robert's secret. <laughs> and I think I'm ready to answer the question that inspired today's show. Why does my body make so much noises? And the big answer is... Well, Mohammed, I think the best way for me to answer this is in song. So I asked Malcolm to come back and help me. You ready? Yeah. Our bodies are noisy living machines. We burp, tick, up, or sniff, sniff, sneeze. Our joints go crack, our butts go pop. The reason for this is quite the gas. We swallow, digest, or just need to fast. Excess gases are too much air. Make belly sound like a cranky, cranky bear. The best noise that I have found are the beats I break to get down. It's what I know, I have no doubt. I'll see you next time on Finest of Felt.